evening, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Franck Elena was first elected as the MPP for Nickel Belt in 2007. She has worked for almost a decade as the NDP critic for the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and in this role was a strong advocate for long-term care reform. France most recently has been the health critic for the official opposition in Ontario. Over to you, France. Oh no, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Bonjour tout le monde, Annie. And I want to start by wishing a happy International Older Persons Day to everyone. Bonne journée internationale des aînés. As it was mentioned, my name is France Gelina. I'm the MPP for the writing of Nickel Belt. And for the last 13 years, I have been the health critic for my party, the NDP. So I want to start by making it clear to everyone that aging is not a disease. Aging is a part of life. But as we age, our needs change. So I want to start by talking a little bit about what we call the social determinants of health. Things like if you stop smoking, if you have a healthy weight, if you eat healthy food, if you exercise, if you limit your alcohol intake, you will get healthier no matter your age. But the pandemic has also shown us something that many of us already knew, and that's the what I call the social, the personal relationship, the personal interaction are also very strong determinants of health for older people. You will see that in some of the models, alternate models of long-term care, they call it the overall well-being of seniors. So back to long-term care. Um, we are in the middle of the pandemic and today we're at 1,867 deaths from residents of our long-term care home due to COVID. I'll share a story with you. On Monday, a good friend of mine who is a resident of a long-term care home in my riding sent me this email and she says, France, yesterday was the third Saturday in a row that I did not get my bath because the home was short staffed. Again, because of lack of person in long-term care, lack of personnel. My friend would like to have a bath every day, but she only has it on Tuesdays and Saturday. And now for the last three Saturdays, they were short PSW and she did not get her bath. This has a direct impact on the quality of care, but this is something we know how to fix. Long-term care could recruit and retain a stable workforce of PSW if they make PSW jobs a career. What does that mean? That means giving them full-time work, giving them a decent pay, giving them a few sick days, benefits, a pension plan, and a workload that a human being can handle. You make, we make PSW jobs career and there will not be any more working short and my friend not getting her bath on Saturday night. This will also improve the quality of care to, to the people. I know that we've talked a little bit about the butterfly model. Uh, the butterfly, uh, think of it as you have your standard, uh, what we call uh, patient care plan, where you look at things like the activities of daily living, uh, feeding, clothing, washing, medication. But under the butterfly model, you have what we call a being with me. Remember when I talked about the determinants of health, the social personal relationship, the personal interaction? This is what makes quality care. Right now, most of what we have are um, 32 pods in long-term care, that is 32 residents, where one PSW will have seven minutes to get her eight residents ready, seven minutes each to get her eight residents ready within an hour. So at seven o'clock, 
she flicks the lights on in your bedroom and seven minutes later you are washed clothed transfer into your wheelchair had your denture glasses earring aids put in and you're dressed i don't know how long it took you to do all of those things this morning but i don't need glasses i don't need hearing aid i don't need a denture and it took me way longer than seven minutes to go from my bed to out the door and into the dining room for breakfast with the butterfly model People uh, wake up at their own time, uh, they get up at their own time, they go for breakfast at their own time. There are models that exist within the long-term care homes that we know to make things better, but there are also lots of other models. I was lucky enough to go visit some of them in, East, in uh, Western Europe, but I know uh, that Mrs. Walsh, who is following me, will be talking more about this. They had given me five minutes, I could go on for five hours, Happy International Older Persons Day. And I know we can do better for all of us uh, by fixing our broken long-term care system. Thank you so much, Franz, for taking the time and for your, for your uh, informative uh, talk. So I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, who's Moira Welsh. Moira is an investigative reporter with the Toronto Star. She has written on seniors' issues since publishing an investigation into long-term care back in 2003. Moira is also the author of a forthcoming book called Happily Ever Older to be published in February. So um, that's exciting. Everybody will want to read that, I'm sure, uh, which looks at evolving ways to live in our later years. So over to you now, Moira. Unmute, unmute. Down at the bottom of your screen. To the left. You might also be able to unmute it. Anthony, can you unmute her? Can't. She's also a participant or a panelist, just as you are. So I'm not able to. I've asked, okay. to, asked to unmute. Oh, but it, her yes, her microphone is turned off. So Moira, on the uh, bottom of your screen, there's a microphone that just has to be clicked. Take the red line out of it. That's odd. Can you see the microphone, Moira? So could she not hear us either? No. We were talking to her earlier. Yeah. Moira, yeah. can you hear us? If you nod your head, if you can hear us. Moira, give us the thumbs up if you can hear us. That's odd. Okay, well, in uh, terms of timing, uh, we'll hopefully get Moira back on, but I'm gonna move along to our next speaker, who is Monica Patton. And CARP Ottawa is proud to have a great partner in Goodwill Ambassadors with Compassionate Ottawa. Monica Patton is the president, and she will talk about their journey and what they firmly believe is one of the most important steps we can all take by simply starting the conversation. Monica. Hey, thank you so much, Rick and uh, Cheryl, two wonderful volunteers with Compassionate Ottawa. I'm, I'm, I've, I've been uh, delighted to be here and to have heard the uh, entire presentation starting, um, I guess, when it started at one. So very, very informative, and I'm looking forward to telling others at Compassionate Ottawa about what I've learned. So I want to tell you, I want to tell you a story, actually, to begin. Um, I, not very long ago, I was with a group of people, uh, I don't know, 14 people or so, and we were talking about one of the topics that 
that I'll, I'm going to mention a little bit later as well called advanced care planning. And at the end of the, the conversation, a couple stood up, an elderly couple, um, you know, probably well into their 80s, as a matter of fact. And they turned around and they said to the other people in the room, this has been extraordinary. We are in a room with our very best friends. And we have never before tonight had a conversation with you about what it means to grow older and to think about our death to think about the end of our lives. We barely had that conversation with each other, but we haven't had it among our friends. That's partly what Compassionate Ottawa is all about. It's about encouraging conversations about values and wishes and beliefs, things that are really important to us as we are all at our age, thinking about the last years of our life, preparing for the kind of care that we want tell you that in Canada, and these are 2018 and 2019 uh, statistics that I'm going to offer to you, um, about 80% of Canadians have given some thought to how they'd like to be cared for at the end of their life. But actually only 20% of that group have prepared a plan or had conversations with others about that. 36% have had some conversation with families, only 36% of Canadians. And we, we just need to put that in the context of COVID. And we, will, we all know how tragic it has been for many families, both here and, and in other parts of the world, where there has been no ability to have a conversation, a conversation about values, about wishes and beliefs, things that matter to you as you think family members think about how you'd like to be cared for at the end of your life. So I want to tell you that we at Compassionate Ottawa believe that there is a real urgency, an urgency to build the capacity in communities to care for each other and to care for our loved ones. That is not for a minute to mean that we shouldn't be paying all the attention we've been talking about this afternoon to long-term care and to institutional care, it needs to be, there needs to be more of it, there needs, there needs to be, it needs to be better, we, all of that. But we would say, all of us in the community have a responsibility, in fact, to become engaged as community members to, in caring for each other. We're an aging society, we've heard that all afternoon, we know that, we live with that every day. We know that there will not be enough institutional hospital care for us as we end uh, near the end of our lives. So we have to build it into our community. But here's the challenge. We live in a death denying culture. We don't want to talk about this. We don't want to talk about the process of getting older and nearing the end of our lives. So Compassionate Ottawa, how do we enter into this? Well, we're a community movement starting here in Ottawa, but I want to tell you there are compassionate communities developing across the country, as a matter of fact. We are a community group, about 600 people of us now on our mailing list, who are working hard to change the culture of dying. That's our business, to change the culture, excuse me, to change the culture of dying. We actually believe that everybody in the community should have an opportunity to enjoy wellness, and respect, self-respect, respect of others until the very end of their lives. We also know, and again, we're seeing this in the COVID days, but it, but it has happened for generations. We also know that people can be very isolated. They are very isolated when they are dying, when they are living with a serious illness. We know about the, the isolation and the loneliness. Compassionate Ottawa, believes it is important that we all reach out and help people who are dealing, their families, who are dealing with death and dying and loss and grief. We do this in a variety of ways. At the core of our work, all volunteers, we have two staff people who help us with Zoom calls, for example, and other technical aspects of our work, but all of our work is undertaken by volunteers. Cheryl and Rick are among that crowd and many other amazing people in Ottawa have joined us as volunteers. And what do we do? Well, at the core of our work is, is 
conversation. We believe in the importance of fostering and supporting people in having conversations. We do that through workshops. We do that on topics like advanced care planning, making sure that you have talked with your friends or your family, your, your family physician, whomever is important in your life about what matters to you. We do that in faith communities. In fact, the conversation I was relating to you earlier took place in a faith community where everybody knew everybody, but they hadn't talked about that process of getting ready for the end of their lives. We do it in workplaces. We have, a, we have an initiative to work in schools. Not, that's not so much with seniors, but it is with, we all know that there is um, tragedy and loss and death in, in schools, um, among staff, among teachers, among children, among their families. So we're encouraging conversations uh, in those settings. We do it by writing, but we do it by workshops and in a variety of different ways. What, what we do is provide support to people of all ages and all backgrounds, no matter who they are, where they come from, how they want to reach out to us. We support them in having conversations about dying and grieving and about the end of their lives. I'm just going to end by, by that's just a snapshot um, of, of, of what we do, but I, I, I want to emphasize again that every community can have a compassionate community, can be a compassionate community. You can do it formally, you can do it informally. We've chosen to do it fairly formally, but a compassionate community is made up of people who reach out to each other, neighbor to neighbor, community to community, and, and express their care and their concern for each other, particularly, particularly as we grow older, more vulnerable, live with serious illness, and are coming toward the end of our life. Thanks for this opportunity to be part of, part of this uh, afternoon. Well, thank you, Monica. And it's a privilege working with your team. And we sure hope that ACP can work its way across Ontario and Canada. And for all the folks that are listening in today, if you'd like to know more about it, please feel free to call us at CARP and I'll certainly forward on to you, to, to Monica. Great. So Moira, I see that you're unmuted. I'm unmuted, thank you. It's back to you. Thank you so much. This is my first uh, Zoom speech, so I'm glad I just uh, entered it with uh, uh, a bit of drama, I guess. Um, thank you to Kathy and to CARP for inviting me today. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss some of the stories I cover for the Toronto Star and also some evolving success stories from book research. These are precarious times for many people, particularly those who are vulnerable and living in long-term care or retirement homes. We are seeing another surge of COVID-19 and given the lingering physical and emotional devastation from the first wave, it's not clear how residents and staff will manage a second round. As a reporter for the Star, I spent the past months focused on long-term care. As we all saw, it wasn't just about the virus, the loss of staff and the terrible deaths. This experience also exposed the harm created by isolation. It made us all realize that loneliness, even in non-pandemic times, is emotionally and physically debilitating, especially for older people. The tragedy of this, the images we saw and the stories journalists told, means that the need for well-being and long-term care is now on the radar of the public and the decision makers. These are challenging times, but they also come with opportunities for real change. Right now, in Ontario, the Ministry of Long-Term Care is awarding new nursing home licenses and a lot of money for renovations or the construction of new homes. That means governments have the opportunity to focus on a transformative idea, the combination of emotional health and the architectural design of nursing homes. It is also a great way to attract new workers. Once built, these homes will last for another 30 years. To put that in context, they will be the nursing homes of the Gen Xers. So the question is, why is the government still accepting the old institutional designs for the homes that will take us into the future? It is still acceptable to build a home with units of 32 people, but not many people believe it is actually healthy to live that way. To be fair, Ontario is asking operators to provide new ideas in their licensing proposals, and some of those are good. But there's no requirement, no baseline demand for a plan that shows how people can live without isolation. 
and with deep emotional connections to staff and one another. These are the relationships that allow us to flourish as we age. There's also no requirement that the design of these new homes reflects the knowledge we now have, showing that smaller households create, they, they diminish aggression, they are better for individual happiness, worker satisfaction, and infection control. The people I've met across North America or Europe say that smaller households give us a more natural way of life. It allows people to step outside in nature, burn off energy, and sleep better. I've written about these issues, combined, describing the importance of combining the right design with the programs that enable residents and staff to live with meaning. In De Hogevik, in the Netherlands, people with severe dementia often join their caregiver on a walk to the on-site store to pick up the meat and vegetables for the evening dinner. In doing so, they stepped outdoors in the fresh air. Maybe they even used umbrellas in the rain, but it gave a daily purpose and interaction with others. It was natural, not institutional. I've been to other North American homes that have their own version of these principles, including a retirement community in North Carolina that promotes the daily interaction of people living with and without cognitive decline as a normal way to live. Here in Ontario, I interviewed Jill Knowlton of Primacare Living, who's pushing hard for new standards. Her plans include a new village or aging in place community in Waterdown near Hamilton. It would have eight households of, sorry, would have households of eight people for those living with severe dementia. The other households will have 16 residents, half the size of the current 32 person design. People will have access to wide outdoor spaces. They will share space with younger seniors or people from the community. Knowlton believes that design and emotion focused care are entwined, that one can't fully succeed without the other. And it just makes sense. Nobody wants to live in a nursing home. No one expects to be that vulnerable, but as time passes, it can happen to the best of us. That is why the decisions made now by the federal government for promised long-term care standards and the Ontario government for the new licenses and homes will have a profound impact on the way many of us live in our later years. Thank you. Well, thank you, Moira, and I'm glad you were able to get back on. That was an excellent speech, and we all look forward to seeing your book. Thank so you. So when it's published, let us know. I will. Thank you. And thank you, Kathy, to organizing this component. Uh, we certainly hope we'll be better as a province if we can ensure that your ideas and suggestions can be put into place. Betty Hope Gittens has been putting her best foot forward to help others for many years. In celebration of her 80th birthday, she did it literally as well as figuratively by walking the entire 800 kilometers or 500 miles of the Camino de Santiago Trail in Spain. She left Canada on Thursday, April the 18th and got to the start of the pilgrimage on Good Friday, April the 19th. She started her walk on Easter Sunday as Easter to her is the most important day of the year. What is most amazing of her walk is that she raised over $200,000 for long-term care, as well as funds in her native Barbados. She emphasizes that one person can make a difference. She is the oldest Canadian ever to walk the whole trail. And she is not finished yet, as she still walks about 14 kilometers a day to stay healthy and to stay, be invigorated. Betty, thank you for joining us today. And we're so grateful to have you share your story with us to inspire seniors all across our country. Please tell us how and why you did it. Betty Giddens. And unmute yourself, Betty. There you go. All right. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Rick. And um, why did I do it? That was your question. Because we hear so much talk. We, you know, we, we need when we see a need, we need to address it. And being from a small island, 
we didn't have the luxuries and probably still don't of long-term care homes. That is a function that is done by the family. My father had an illness that could not be addressed in Barbados. So I brought him and my mother here. I also had an aunt here. And uh, eventually he was cured here in Ottawa. And um, I built on what in those days was called a granny suite. I don't hear that expression anymore, but I built that on for them. An article was written about me in a newspaper and it said, she isn't just a, doing a double decker. She's not just in a double decker sandwich area. She's a triple decker because I had three people over 80 living with me. But that was what I knew. And they got the best care I could give them. I did have um, a medical husband, I should say that, who did help quite a bit. But we, we tend to look after our own families. And uh, that probably, I don't know why it couldn't be done more here, to be honest with you, but I don't see it that much here. However, exercise to me is something that should be, should be compulsory. It should be in, in the nursing, even before you get to the nursing home stage, way before that, in your 30s and 40s, if you exercise every day, that is what keeps us in better health. Takes a big strain off the government, takes a big strain off all the nursing homes. And I have believed that for over 40 years. And at 81, I am still walking and I take absolutely no medication. To be honest with you, I do have a sip of Barbados rum every day. <laughs> and that's important time. I'm helping the economy of Barbados. But uh, I do believe that we're still not going about it the right way here. We are looking to put our old folks somewhere and then complain that they're not well looked after. I see it somewhat differently and perhaps that is why I got involved. First with Help the Aged Canada and then I was on Help the Aged, Help Age International and then all with all, dealing with old people with their needs and then with Ethiopia Aid and for the last 12 years with elder care, the Elder Care Foundation. Have I made a difference? Financially I have, because I, I can raise money and I know how to raise money and not a penny of it comes to me, it goes to the homes. But have I really made a difference? I don't know, because I just seem to be, not getting my, the message that I want across. Don't let us wait until the 80s. Let us start from when we are in our 30s with a rigorous program. Rick, you probably remember there was a program in the government here called Participation. Do you remember that? And that was I years do. ago. Yes, that was years ago. And another government came in and it was thrown out. But that was, was made exercise compulsory. And that's what I am for. Just getting people, if nothing else, if they can look at me and see that at 81 and a half, I'm still walking several kilometers every day and enjoying it. And in so doing, I continue to be able to help the less fortunate seniors here in Ottawa. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping 
that we can come to terms with doing it this exercise earlier rather than waiting until all our illnesses step in. Thank you, Rick, for inviting me to be here today. Well, thank you, Betty, and your story is so inspiring. And just to let you know, CARP Ottawa is about to form a partnership with the revised participation. So oh. we will have you as the mentor. Well, I would be happy to be the mentor. Thank you. It would be a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Our next speaker is Todd Nicholson. And I have had the privilege of knowing Todd for many years in his capacity as one of Canada's leading Paralympic athletes. He has served as the captain of Canada's sledge hockey, or formerly known as para hockey, gold medal team, as a chef de mission for Canada at the Sochi Russia Winter Paralympics, and now as the president of Canada's Own the Podium. A couple of years ago now, Todd and his family suffered the worst trauma any family could have by having their house totally demolished in a terrible tornado. And he will share his life experiences with us and how his community supported him through very trying times. We are thankful he is well and with us today. Todd. Unmute yourself. There you go. Did you unmute yourself? Hit the unmute button. It looks like we've actually lost Todd completely. I just saw him a minute ago. Okay. Well, let's hope we get him back on. And again, with time, I'm going to move on to Cheryl. Cheryl serves as one of our CARP Ottawa Vice Presidents, and she's been really busy the last eight months. Mm -hmm. And she will offer some pertinent information, super opportunities, that is, she has led the planning team in developing and promoting for all of us. Many of our programs can be made available to you across Ontario via virtual online links. Cheryl, please provide some information on your program work. Sure. Well, first of all, um, happy National Seniors Day to everybody. I mean, and what amazing and fabulous speakers. And um, I, I guess I'm going to be guilted into exercising more from, from Betty. It's like, yeah, okay, if she can do that at, at 81, I, I better get moving. So anyways, I'd also like a um, big shout out to Barry, Brampton, Brantford, Etobicoke, Greater Bay of Quinte, Halliburton, Halton, Hamilton, London St. Thomas, Mississauga, Niagara Region, Scarborough, Sudbury, I've seen a few questions flashing by from Sudbury there, Toronto Downtown, Windsor Essex, and Quebec, and none of it. Um, so usually CARP has some great events that we, are, we know are, are, are very well attended, and unfortunately because of COVID, um, no events, no gatherings. But we have been communicating with our members um, with some really excellent Zoom webinars um, for our membership. In September, we did, um, as um, Monica has already said, we just did the first one with Compassionate Ottawa. There are going to be a lot more. And sitting in on that advanced care, care planning uh, webinar was um, enlightening, emotional, um, but boy, does it ever start a conversation. So um, if, if you uh, are a CART member and you haven't signed up for um, one of the uh, Compassionate Ottawa uh, webinars, um, it, it's, it's well worth it. Um, we got some fun stuff too. We did some fun stuff in uh, September with Colette Travel. And I know we'd all love to, to get back traveling someday, but Colette is um, putting together uh, on how to do that safely when we, when we can do that. Um, one of the other popular ones was uh, Meg Stickles Aim Fitness. Um, so there, everybody, yes, it's like, you know, <laughs> Betty's the example, um, sign up for the, the, the AIM Fitness ones. Um, uh, Meg's one's filled up very quickly in September. She's doing another one in October. She'll be doing one in December, and we are probably going to keep Meg coming back on a month-to-month -month basis. Um, we will post her uh, webinars um, in our newsletter so that people can actually access them again if, they, if they'd like to. Um, we've got other ones coming up in the future with uh, Dignity and Bowie Financial. 
And then November is going to be a big month um, because we're uh, November is Fall Prevention Month. If, if uh, people are unaware of that. And we're proud to be sharing um, the uh, with other Ontario chapters, and I know a few of you already signed up for us, and you know, yes, you'll be participating. Um, there are going to be four webinars dealing with issues around fall prevention, um, like stay safe this winter, bathroom falls, a biggie, um, how to talk to your healthcare provider or even your pharmacist about, about falls if you've fallen, um, and uh, making stairs safe for everybody because you know, it's not just seniors that, that fall downstairs. Um, and we're really pleased that our affinity partner, Stana Stairlifts, is going to be providing some excellent information. Uh, so I think that's great. We're going to be doing more travel in the future. Uh, we're going to be looking at other partnerships so that we can bring in other excellent webinars. So just um, stay tuned. Um, you'll get either e-blasts for them separately or we'll um, promote them in our newsletter. So I, all I can say out there to everybody is again, happy National Seniors Day. If you're not a CART member, join. You know what? There are numerous other benefits. All, just, all you have to do is go to cart.ca, click benefits, and um, you'll see some of the savings that you can be making. So you know what? We seniors can be a big voice. And as Aislinn said, <laughs> are they ready for us? So Rick, thanks. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and certainly to all of our other friends in across Ontario and Quebec and Nunavut, um, these webinars can be certainly made accessible to you. And I see Todd is back in action. Hello, Rick. How are you, Todd? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks very much for the introduction. I apologize um, for uh, the technology advancements within the home here are not the best. <laughs> meaning my thumbs are too big and when I hit the button it uh, cut me off. Go for um, it. But I, wanted to, uh, I just wanted to, to say um, congratulations to everybody for joining uh, who were able to join today and, and actually started watching the program today at one o'clock and then moved on to the to the original ones. Uh, je m'excuse, je, je ne parle pas français, um, so unfortunately my presentation will be in English, uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak today and just give you a little bit of insight in terms of um, I'm a T12 paraplegic. As Rick said, I've been able to accomplish quite a bit in my life. Um, as somebody who was born without a disability and then acquired my disability when I was 18 years old, uh, where I was in a car accident on my way home from the high school prom and my life drastically changed. And I had to live, start to learn how to live my life very different without the use of my legs um, and figure out a way to, as been said by many of the panelists before me uh, and how physical activities um, are really important uh, to all of us in order to ensure that we maintain a healthy lifestyle. Uh, we, we can hopefully uh, create that lifestyle where we're not on medications, we're able to travel, we're able to do all the things that we love to do. And as somebody who has traveled the world, um, I can tell you that we are very fortunate here in Canada in terms of accessibility, in terms of creating that awareness. But I think one of the biggest things that we are starting to do, um, as everybody has said before, you know, the baby boomers, we're in an aging population. One of the biggest challenges that I think that the majority of people have right now and are going to have into the future, just accessing the technology. Um, you know, you just talked about earlier about the number of people who you were hoping to become members. I think one of the biggest challenges you have uh, with, I look at my parents uh, who live in the Ottawa Valley. I look at my parents and, and they are not connected. They, they, my mom's on Facebook, uh, but other than that, they don't do Zoom. They don't do Skype. Um, so the fact of COVID hitting and everything has really created a big challenge for some seniors to be able to get out and still have that interaction. Uh, we have people that are in homes and kids can't go watch or can't go talk to them. And uh, the capability of just picking up a phone uh, is not really there anymore. Uh, the majority of people either have cell phones and landlines don't really exist anymore. As Rick said, we lost our home in a tornado uh, back in 2018. We are the 1st of October today, 2020, and it's only as of yesterday that we got our occupancy permit to move back in. Um, now, we've been living in the, in the house pre previous to that, but 
Um, and part of that process, there was no phone lines put in. Um, so, you know, how do people still connect? Well, unfortunately, through technology. So we've got to figure out a way to ensure that our seniors are still connected. Um, because we're not able to social, or because we're not able to meet large groups anymore, the capability of getting together is still a challenge. I know for us following the tornado, one of the biggest things that I tried to promote through my social media, my networking, was shortly after the tornado hit, um, people, I was getting phone calls from around the world because of my background in sports and people knowing who I was and did they need anything or did they need any help. Um, two months after the tornado, I didn't know what I needed. Uh, and my question and my uh, suggestion to everybody that's on this phone call right now is, I would like to challenge you to go out to some of your friends um, just like I challenged them <clears throat> probably six, seven months ago, check in on the people that um, are not socially connected. Check in on the ones that uh, are not connected uh, either through social gatherings or whatever. Find a way to, to connect with them to make sure that they're still doing okay, that their family's checking in on them. Um, because as we all know, you can't go visit. Uh, or if you do, you have to quarantine and so on and so forth. My full-time job, I work for Canada Customs. So I'm sitting here right now in front of my computer allowing dignitaries and, and people into the country uh, as, this, as this Zoom meeting was going on. So that we're all able to multitask. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that we need to look at and need to consider is we also need to slow down and, and really consider, uh, you know, I live in the country. And for my kids to get to school, they need to go on a school bus because there is no public transportation out here. That's a choice that I made to live out here. Uh, but unfortunately, there are no bus drivers because the majority of bus drivers out in this area were all seniors. And because of high risk, unfortunately, I've chosen not to come back to work. I totally understand and totally respect that. So I drive my kids to and from school every day. But again, these are all just some of the things that we need to really focus on and think about and again, I challenge everybody on the phone and anybody who's watching the, the question to do me a favor and just reach out to somebody that you know that isn't socially uh, connected um, and make sure that they're okay. So again, thanks very much, Rick, for this opportunity to, to speak to your members. And uh, I really encourage everybody to, to take on the challenge. Well, thank you, Todd, and I really value our friendship. We've known each other a long time, and I'm truly inspired by your words and certainly what you've done for Canada and all of seniors in our country. Thank you again. Thanks, Rick. Well, well ladies and gentlemen, that uh, culminates our presentation of our speakers. I certainly want to thank all of our panelists for tremendous perspectives in terms of helping us celebrate <laughs> National Seniors Day. We hope that you've enjoyed today's presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us at carp, ottawa at carp.ca or give us a call at 613-755-0055. In closing though, I would be remiss not to extend our thanks to all of our outstanding first line responders, nurses, doctors, caregivers, and all healthcare professionals for their dedication and commitment to make our country safe and the place to be. Stay safe, be well. Thanks very much. Anthony, back to you. Thank you again, everybody. Okay, Rick, thank you very much. That does conclude our event. I know that we had some questions asked in the q and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to those, but we will do our best to answer them right now. Uh, and just one question there, Moira, what's the name of their book? of your book that they can look for on the shelves soon. There you go, I can hear you. I just, I did it. Um, my, my book is called Happily Ever Older and it's looking at innovative and evolving ways that um, people are choosing to live in the later years. And that could be in long-term care in the traditional sense or retirement homes or in the community as well. And it also explores the way that leaders in the field have changed their position over time um, so that the programs and the ideas and philosophies that they use in their homes um, are not static and that they're constantly checking themselves and looking at new research and innovating as time moves on. 
Okay, thank you thank very you much. Thank you for asking. Thank you. All right, Rick. Thanks, Anthony. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Thanks for thank you. Who came joining us today on both the national and the local event.